Richard Penniman, better known as Little Richard, combined the sacred shouts of the black church and the profane sounds of the blues to create some of the world's first and most influential rock and roll records. Little Richard did not invent rock and roll. Other musicians had already been mining a similar vein by the time he recorded his first hit Tutti Fruity, which was a raucous song about sex with its lyrics cleaned up, but its meaning hard to miss in a New Orleans recording studio in September 1955. Chuck Berry and Fats Domino had reached the pop top 10, Bo Diddley had topped the rhythm and blues charts, and Elvis Presley had been making records for a year. But Little Richard, delving deeply into the wellsprings of gospel music and the blues, pounding the piano furiously and screaming as if for his very life, raised the energy level several notches and created something not quite like any music that had been heard before. Something new, thrilling, and more than a little dangerous. He was crucial in upping the voltage from high-powered R&B into the similar, yet different, guise of rock and roll. Richard Wayne Penniman was born on December the 5th, 1932, in Macon, Georgia. The third of 12 children, he clashed with his moonshine-selling father, and was ordered out of the family home as a teenager. A white family named Johnson took him in, and Penniman, who had honed his musical ability in church, started performing in their club. Depending on the story, he was called Little Richard either as a childhood nickname or because he was underage. A link with an Atlanta DJ led to a signing by RCA, but Little Richard's recordings in a Louis Jordan jump blue style, failed to catch fire. For a time, Little Richard was a dishwasher at a Greyhound bus station. He kept playing music, however, and in 1955 sent a demo recording to Specialty Records. Specialty's founder, Art Roop, liked what he heard and asked Little Richard to go to New Orleans to record with members of Fats Domino's backing band. Producer Blackwell recalled him in a memoir as This cat in a loud shirt with hair waved up six inches above his head. During a break in what had been a lackluster session, Little Richard let loose with Tutti Fruity. The rest, with a polish from Blackwell, is, as they say, history. Tutti Fruity hit number two on the R&B charts and the top 20 on Billboard's pop charts, selling a million copies. Little Richard was off and running. One of Richard's early bands had the young, then unknown singer James Brown, a 14-year-old keyboardist named Billy Preston, and the famous and legendary rock guitarist Jimi Hendrix. Art Roop of Specialty Records, the label for which he recorded his biggest hits, called Little Richard dynamic, completely uninhibited, unpredictable, and wild. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. Tutti Fruity rocketed up the charts and was quickly followed by Long Tall Sally and other records now acknowledged as classics. His live performances were electrifying. He'd just burst onto the stage from anywhere, and you wouldn't be able to hear anything but the roar of the audience. The record producer and arranger H.B. Barnum, who played saxophone with Little Richard early in his career, recalled, He'd be on the stage, he'd be off the stage, he'd be jumping and yelling, screaming, whipping the audience on. Rock and roll was an unabashedly macho music in its early days. But Little Richard, who had performed in drag as a teenager, presented a very different picture on stage. Gaudily dressed, his hair piled high, his face aglow with cinematic makeup. He was fond of saying in later years that if Elvis was the king of rock and roll, he was the queen. Off stage, he characterized himself variously as gay, bisexual, and omnisexual. His influence as a performer was immeasurable. It could be seen and heard in the flamboyant showmanship of James Brown, who idolized him and also used some of his musicians when Little Richard began a long hiatus from performing in 1957, and of Prince, whose ambisexual image owed a major debt to this. 
Elvis Presley recorded his songs. The Beatles adopted his trademark sound. Paul McCartney said that the first song he ever sang in public was Long Tall Sally, which he later recorded with the Beatles. Bob Dylan wrote in his high school yearbook that his ambition was to join Little Richard. Little Richard's impact was social as well. I've always thought that rock and roll brought the races together, Little Richard said, especially being from the South where you see the barriers, having all these people who we thought hated us showing all this love. They still had the audiences segregated at concerts in the South in those days, but that changed when Little Richard performed. Most times before the end of the night, they would all be mixed together. If uniting black and white audiences was a point of pride for Little Richard, it was a cause of concern for others, especially in the South. The White Citizens Council of North Alabama issued a denunciation of rock and roll largely because it brought people of both races together. Still, it seemed that nothing could stop Little Richard's drive to the top until he stopped himself. He was at the height of his fame when he left the United States in late September 1957 to begin a tour of Australia. As he told the story, he was exhausted, under intense pressure from the IRS and furious at the low royalty rate he was receiving from specialty records. Without anyone to advise him, he had signed a contract that gave him half a cent for every record he sold. Tutti Frutti had sold half a million copies but had netted him only $25,000. One night in early October before 40,000 fans at an outdoor arena in Sydney, he had an epiphany. That night Russia sent off that very first Sputnik, he recalled, referring to the first satellite sent into space. It looked as though the big ball of fire came directly over the stadium, about two or 300 feet above our heads. It shook my mind. It really shook my mind. I got up from the piano and said, this is it, I am through. I am leaving show business to go back to God. He had one last top 10 hit, Good Golly Miss Molly, recorded in 1956, but not released until early 1958. By then, he had left rock and roll behind. He became a traveling evangelist. He entered Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, a Seventh-day Adventist school to study for the ministry. He cut his hair, got married, and began recording gospel music. For the rest of his life, he would be torn between the gravity of the pulpit and the pull of the stage. He was lured back to the stage in 1962, and over the next two years, he played to wild acclaim in England, Germany, and France. Among his opening acts were the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, then at the start of their careers. By the end of the 1960s, sold-out performances in Las Vegas and triumphant appearances at rock festivals in Atlantic City and Toronto were sending a clear message. Little Richard was back to stay. By his own account, alcohol and cocaine began to sap his soul. I lost my reasoning, he would later say. And in 1977, he once again turned from rock and roll to God. He became a Bible salesman, began recording religious songs again, and for the second time disappeared from the spotlight. He did not stay away forever. The publication of his biography in 1984 signaled his return to the public eye and he began performing again. By now he was as much a personality as a musician. In 1986 he played a prominent role as a record producer in Paul Mazursky's hit movie Down and Out in Beverly Hills, and on television he appeared on talk, variety, comedy and award shows. He officiated at celebrity weddings and preached at celebrity funerals. He could still raise the roof in concert. In December 1992, he stole the show at a rock and roll revival concert at Wembley Arena in London. I'm 60 years old today, he told the audience, and I still look remarkable. He continued to look remarkable with the help of wigs and thick pancake makeup as he toured intermittently into the 21st century. But age eventually took its toll. By 2007, he was walking on stage with the aid of two canes. In 2012, he abruptly ended a performance at the Howard Theatre in Washington, telling the crowd, I can't hardly breathe. 
A year later, he told Rolling Stone magazine he was retiring. By the time he stopped performing, Little Richard was in both the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, he was inducted in the Hall's first year, and the Songwriters Hall of Fame and the recipient of Lifetime Achievement Awards from the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences and the Rhythm and Blues Foundation. Tutti Frutti was added to the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry in 2010. If Little Richard ever doubted that he deserved all the honours he received, he never admitted it. A lot of people call me the architect of rock and roll, he once said. I don't call myself that, but I believe it's true. On May the 9th, 2020, Little Richard died at the age of 87 at his home in Tullahoma, Tennessee, from a cause related to bone cancer after a two-month illness. Richard received tributes from many popular musicians, including Bob Dylan, Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, John Fogarty, Elton John and Lenny Kravitz, as well as many others, such as film director John Waters, who were all influenced by Richard's music and persona. He is interred at Oakwood University Memorial Garden Cemetery in Huntsville, Alabama. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favorite Little Richard song that you like the most or perhaps a moment in his career that you remember? Let us know in the comments below and if you haven't already done so, click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content.